because many of these um, theories and things that we're talking about totally conflict with the whole theory of evolution, right? When we were talking about, well, why would some of this stuff be covered up? Well, our history doesn't tell us there were there were these intelligent giants running around on the earth that possibly had very high levels of technology going back to ancient times. That would really, if, if that were true, that would really throw off what we've been taught. Floyd, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's so great to have you here. I'm so excited to speak with you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on your show, and I appreciate your audience uh, tuning in. I think we're going to have a very fun and interesting conversation on giants. And uh, if you want to traverse some other rabbit holes connected with them, we can we can do that too. So I'll I'll go where you want to go. Yes, trust me, we're going to get into some of those rabbit holes for sure, because, you know, doing research prior to this interview, I went down a few rabbit holes. So, you know, buckle in, we're, we're going to go all over with this. But I wanted to start by saying that, you know, obviously your book is called The Red Haired Giants of Lovelock Cave and Other Ancient Mysteries. And you cover quite a few topics related to giants and ancient mysteries. Um, and these giants include the biblical giants, the Nephilim from the Book of Enoch, the Anunnakis from Sumer, and the red-haired giants who came out of Nevada and lived among the Native American Paiute group. So before we get into all of that, right, and how they're all related, I want to know what got you interested in ancient mysteries and researching giants. Where did that all start from? Yeah, it started when I was a very young boy. There used to be a popular television series called In Search Of, and it was hosted by uh, Leonard Nimoy. Um, he was the host, and they had all kinds of interesting topics on uh, UFOs, Atlantis, um, paranormal stuff, just a lot of fascinating topics. And that, that piqued my curiosity, and then I started going to the school library and checking out whatever books I can find that on the you know, that they talked about on the show. And that's really when my interest started. And I've always been interested as well in like ancient legends and myths and things of that nature. So it started from a, a young age. And then when I was in high school, uh, a friend of mine gave me a book uh, by Eric von Donneken called Chariots of the Gods. And that book um, also sparked my interest because von Donneken's work talked about uh, potential ancient aliens interacting with our ancestors. And I thought he posed some really interesting questions in his book. And again, that sparked my interest. And when I got out of high school, um, I got into the works of Graham Hancock and uh, his whole research on the ancient civilizations and um, how uh, a comet hit our planet about 12,000 years ago. And this big cataclysmic event happened and there was advanced uh, civilization or civilizations that were wiped out, but there were remnants that were left and they passed on their knowledge to all these different cultures. Uh, and then my interest continued with the works of Zachariah Sitchin, who uh, studied the ancient cuneiform uh, clay tablets of Samaria going back four or 5,000 years and uh, research into the Anunnaki and the ancient Sumerians' belief that these were extraterrestrial gods that came down and pretty much taught them everything they knew. And as far as giants go, I listened to a presentation by a researcher named Jim Vieira, probably about eight years ago. And he did a presentation on giants. And of course, I remember hearing about giants, you know, growing up as a kid, you you know, you Jack and the Beanstalk, and you, you hear about the Titans um, uh, in Greek mythology. And also too, um, I had a book when I was younger and it was on giants and it talked about the lore of giants from all these different, uh, different cultures. And the book started off with the Genesis uh, 6 account in the Bible, and I'll just paraphrase it. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days and thereafter. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, uh, they, bore, uh, they bore giants, and they became mighty men of renown. And so I thought, that is really interesting. But I, at such a young age, I, I didn't make any connections. I just thought, wow, the, this is weird. They're talking about giants. And then, of course, many of us are familiar in the Bible with the story of David and Goliath and, and, and how David defeats uh, Goliath. 
and so after hearing this presentation by Jim Vieira, he was referencing a lot of these old newspaper articles going back from probably the mid 1800s into the 1960s, 1970s of giant skeleton discoveries here in North America. And some of these accounts were very detailed by very credible um, witnesses. And I thought, wow, this is wild stuff. Like, could this be true or could these just all be hoaxes or maybe a misidentification of bones? And I thought, well, if he's pulling up all these articles, I should be able to go online and I should be able to research and find some of these. And I, so I started subscribing to a lot of these old newspaper databases and putting together a folder collecting um, all these articles on these giant skeleton discoveries. And sure enough, it didn't take me a, a, a very long to accumulate a large number of articles. And during that research, I was astonished just at how much documentation there was. And I'm not saying that necessarily all these articles are, are true. However, there are so many that are out there that even if only a small percentage of those articles are true, there's a significant number of these discoveries that were made. And so that was the basis of me deciding to write a book on, on the giants. Uh, that, that's kind of my main focus. As you mentioned earlier, I do go into some other topics as well, but I found the, the topic of the giants so interesting. Uh, and then plus with a lot of documentation. And my book is titled The Red-Haired Giants of Lovelock Cave. So I, during my research, I found a, a particular story that happened in Nevada. Uh, the Paiutes in that area, the native peoples, talked about in their history this race of red-haired giants. And they were cannibalistic. They were violent. They attacked the other tribes and they ate their victims. They were they were very evil people. And finally, the Paiutes uh, got tired of being attacked and they united with other local tribes and they waged war on these giants, which lasted for three years, finally culminating at the Lovelock Cave, where they cornered the last of the giants and they threw brush in front of the cave, lit flaming arrows and burnt the giants to death. Wow. There was a lot of evidence on that particular story, a lot more than uh, many of the articles that I had uncovered before as far as uh, photographic evidence. I, I provide some uh, photographs of some of the skulls that came out of the cave. Then you have the Paiute traditions of the red-haired giants and actually artifacts that archaeologists have uncovered, some of which you can still see to this day. Thank you for kind of explaining your interest and in, in what got you into it and a lot of the findings that came from the research and prompted you to write the book because you are correct, right? You know, there's so many stories out there related to giants across different cultures. And I'm not going to lie, I honestly, before, you know, stumbling upon your um, work, I used to just whenever I would hear stuff about giants, especially um, the Nephilim from the, the Bible, I would just kind of chuck it up to mythology, right? As some sort of explanation um, for how certain, you know, people came to be or how we came to be as human beings. But I never gave it any more thought than that. But when I started doing research into the um, red haired giants, um, and I, I realized that there were a lot of, like you said, articles on this, and there's also evidence, right, that mm -hmm. their, their bones or their remains were found in that cave, and actually given to different museums, but they no longer exist, right? Um, or they're missing. So I want to ask, first mm -hmm. of all, where do you think these red-haired giants came from? Did your um, research uncover that? And why do you think their remains have been, you know, either destroyed or why they've gone missing? Yeah, those are some great questions that you ask. Um, as far as in my book, I, I don't particularly um, write about like where they came from. I just kind of present the evidence that I uncovered along with a few different theories. And I leave it up to the readers to, to make a come to a conclusion. And in fact, I encourage people that read my book to do further research. So I cite everything 
in my book in hopes that people that really want to dig into the subject, they can go to um, my references and, and maybe dig deeper. There's different theories on, on where the redhead giants could have come from. Um, I've heard some people uh, claim that could they have been Vikings that came here? You know, they they were large. They were, you know, they were giant sized. They had reddish hair. And there's no Native American tribes that I know of that have red hair. And so, you know, could they have come, you know, from, an, uh, you know, from, um, you know, Scandinavia or some other other country? Um, could they have been uh, descendants of uh, what some people believe, like you mentioned, the, the Nephilim? Could there have been like a remnant? Because in the Bible, in Genesis 6, it talks about there were giants in those days and thereafter. And the whole backstory to Genesis 6, I believe, is contained in some of the books, the apocryphal books that were left out of the canonized version of the Bible. And one of those books is the book of Enoch, and it goes in, into depth as far as who these giants were and how they came to be. And in the book of Enoch, it talks about um, this group of, they were called watchers. They were basically angels that were supposed to be watching over humankind, but they found the women of the earth fair and they became attracted to them. And a group of 200 made a pact together to actually um, go into, as the Bible says, go into, which is have sex with the human women. And in the book of Enoch, it talks about that's what they did. They came down to a place called uh, um, Mount Hermon, which is in Syria, which ironically means uh, uh, mountain of desolation. Mm -hmm. And they interbred uh, with the women and they taught humankind these forbidden arts, the arts of war, the arts of astronomy, astrology. And some researchers believe that those sciences that they taught us, they were called the seven sacred sciences. Um, God didn't want us to learn those, at least at that stage of our development. So they jumped the gun and not only mixed their seed with human women, but they gave humankind forbidden knowledge that we weren't supposed to have. And so that created a lot of problems. And this union of the, ne of, of the watchers with human women created the Nephilim. And Nephilim is a proto-Hebrew word meaning fallen ones. And so the women gave birth to these giants and they were called the Nephilim. And these giants started destroying the earth. They, they fought amongst themselves. They killed the humans. They drank blood. In fact, some people believe that the origins of the vampire, you know, drinking blood originated with, with the Nephilim going back to the ancient times. Mm. And so, you know, a question is, could these be descendants of these original Nephilim? And the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days and thereafter, and I believe and thereafter refers to some that weren't killed off by the great flood, and they survived, and we see evidence of them in the Bible when you're talking about Goliath. He was a descendant of the Nephilim. It says it in the Bible, and not only that, there was another king, King Og of Bashan. He was a giant. He had a 13-foot long bed framed in iron to support his weight. And Moses and his armies end up killing King Og. But once I started really studying the giants and then going back into the Bible, I actually found a lot of references to the giants just in the, can the, the canonized version, let alone in the apocryphal text. It talks a lot about these about these giants. Very fascinating stuff. I want to ask a very layman question, right? Because one thing I, I think that comes to my mind whenever I hear giants, I'm like, how big are we talking here? Are we talking, you know, six foot five? Are we talking seven yeah. foot? Are we talking eight foot? Do you have a sense of what would categorize a giant? Is there, were there mentions of how tall or how big they were in stature? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, well, in the Bible, uh, it, you know, when it was talking about uh, Goliath, um, it puts him at around nine or 10 feet tall. And he ha he wielded a spear that had a, a spearhead at the end that weighed about 15 pounds. And in my book, I have a picture of a replica spear of Goliath that was created by craftsmen based upon the, you know, description in the Bible. And it shows a man holding the spear and it's I mean, it is just, it is gigantic. 
So in the Bible, it puts Goliath around nine or 10 feet. In my research on a lot of the articles that I uncovered of these giant skeletons, uh, I had sizes ranging from eight feet all the way up to some of the biggest ones, which were uh, 16, there was a 16 footer that was supposedly found in Pennsylvania that had a double row of teeth, which is also mentioned in the Bible. Um, David and his mighty men, when they were fighting Goliath's brothers, they reference a particular giant that had a double row of teeth and six fingers on each hand. And I did find some account, newspaper accounts of these giant skeletons with double rows of teeth. And in a few cases, having the extra digits on the hands. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Those are definitely giants. <laughs> giants. Yeah. yeah. So anywhere ranging from eight, eight foot to I think the biggest article uh, giant that I found in an article was like 25 feet, something like that. And oh that was the 1800s. So, you know, the question is, you know, what, you know, it was like this giant thigh bone. And, and doctors at that time examined it. But, you know, we're talking, you know, this is back in the 1800s. So it makes you wonder, could they have found a dinosaur bone, you know, and thought it was a human bone? That's definitely possible. But I think we're looking realistically in the ranges of probably eight, nine feet tall. Wow. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. So speaking of, you know, remains and stuff, I think I, I was curious, you know, like like I, I said before, and like you mentioned in your book, that the remains of the red-haired giants that were discovered in 1911, I believe, are are currently missing, right? Even though they were dispersed to different museums, they're currently missing or they could have been destroyed. What is What theories did you unearth from your research as to why they might be missing or why they seem to no longer be in existence? Sure. Um so when I started researching the the um they were called Sitika and they were known by various names of the native peoples. Uh Sitika means tule eater and tule is a water plant and in that area in Nevada there used to be a large lake and it used to be marshy and so allegedly these giants would um would use the water plant and they would they would eat the water plant amongst other things like humans. Um, and they would make things from this water plant. They would make basketry. They would make um, clothing. In fact, a sandal, a woven uh, Thule sandal came out of Lovelock Cave that had measurements of about 17 inches long. And I did the translation of that shoe, and it translates to a size 29 shoe. Bigger than any, uh, I looked at all the basketball stars to look at their foot size, and no one, no one was 29 you know, size 29. That's so that insane. was insane. It's yeah, it's, it's insane. And so these um, skeletons that were found, these mummies in Lovelock cave, uh, there's discrepancy on exactly how many there were prop. There was probably around 50 or so skeletons that were found. And what's interesting is the largest of the skeletons. And this I found in the um, documentation of the uh, first archeologist LL loud that excavated the cave, he said the largest specimen was given to a local fraternal lodge to be boiled and used in initiation purposes. Oh, wow. And we could go down a whole other rabbit hole with that. But uh, so that disappeared and was given to a fraternal lodge, which is extremely odd because all the other skeletons completely disappeared out of the public view. However, there was a small local museum uh, in an area called Winnemucca that supposedly had a few of the skulls that came out of the cave and they never put them on public display and i thought that was interesting they never displayed them publicly they kept them locked up in cupboards in the basement and in order to see them you had to ask and the curator would take you downstairs and show you the skulls well when i started uh, first investigating the story i contacted the museum and asked them if the skulls were still there because i wanted to i wanted to go see them and they they told me, they said, no, the skulls are, aren't here. They were repatriated back to the native tribes. 
There was a law passed in the 90s called the NAGPRA Act, which was the Native Americans Graves and Repatriation Act, which basically said, you know, if 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 museums have Native American uh, human remains, they had to repatriate those back to the back to the tribes. And I'm all for that. I, I think I think that's a that's a good thing. And so the museum was telling me that they were repatriated back to the caves. And they also said something like they were never put on public display because in this political climate, you know, we could lose our funding, the museum could lose their funding, which I thought, okay, that's a reasonable answer, but you've had those skulls for decades and decades and decades, long before any of these laws, long before any of the political correctness stuff, and yet they were never put on public display. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was extremely strange uh, answer that they gave me. And in fact, I found some uh, people who visited the museum, I mean, going back when they were kids, decades and decades ago. And one person claimed that at one time they had a full mummy down there of a giant. They they said it was probably eight feet tall, nine feet tall, and very well preserved. And they said they'll never forget it because they looked at the hands and they could still see the nails, the nails on the hands. So you know, not only did they have skulls, but they could have actually have had a one time a full mummy if this person's account is legitimate. Mm -hmm. And so they disappeared. The skulls are gone. However, there was a researcher that I contacted that took photographs of these skulls probably about 30 or 40 years ago. And one of the skulls is extremely massive looking and it still had a patch of what looked like red hair on the skull. And then in the upper row of teeth, can you can you can you guess what was up there in the upper row of teeth? Probably like sharp teeth. Not not only were they sharp, but they were double row. Oh, double row. Yes, they yes. Were a double row. They had extra extra teeth. Wow. So yeah, the skulls are gone. You can't you know you can't see them now. Uh, and the and the answer to the second part of your question is, you know, well, you know, why would they be taken away? Why would these giant skeletons, uh, mummies, why would they not be shown to the public? And I believe that that has to do with what what I call knowledge filtration. And there's a great researcher. His name's uh, Michael Cremo. He's written a number of of fantastic books. He was an influence on me. One was uh, Forbidden Archaeology and the Hidden History of the Human Race. I just had the privilege of uh, co-hosting a show to interview him. And I brought up to him, I said, you know, when I first discovered your work, I remember you were talking about knowledge filtration and that really... Um, impacted me, especially when I started doing my own research. Knowledge filtration is basically, um, a, and I'm, I'm referring to a lot of these um, academics, uh, archaeologists, paleoanthropologists, you know, that study this, uh, the ancient bones and things like that. You know, they are taught a certain way in their universities. They're taught a certain dogma. And the way they're trained is anything that falls outside of what they've been taught, it's easy to just sweep it under the rug. It's like, if it doesn't fit into to, to our box, then, you know, get rid of it. You know, it's it's got to be a hoax. It's got to be fake. It's just an anomaly. And so it's just a kind of indoctrination to, um, instead of looking at these things and go, wow, these really don't fit our narrative let's really let's explore this let's you know let's research this instead they just they they sweep it under the rug they they um box it up and put it in a basement uh, as in the case of um the lovelock cave skulls they put them in a in a cupboard and don't even put them on display so it has to do with uh maintaining that that ideology because that can be that can be very um, dangerous. They perceive that as being very dangerous because if they have things that contradict their theories, you know, that could create problems, big problems. Yes, I love how you put that there, right? Because that that was my suspicion as well, right? Because what does it really mean for humankind to admit that there was a time where giants eight foot and above or more, roamed this earth right like what we're hearing from the bible could be true and i just want to take it a little bit you know further and or take it a little bit back <laughs> and 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 go back a little bit more into 
our ancient history with the Sumer or the Sumerians and mm -hmm. with um, them talking about the Anunnaki's as yes. well as like Egypt and ancient genetic engineering. But let, let's start with the Anunnaki's, right? Because yeah. a lot of the description is kind of similar to how they would describe um, the Nephilim, right? We, yes. Which are um, beings from the sky ruling over human beings, mating with human beings. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And could you just kind of, again, one, for the listeners who, if this is the first time hearing about the Anunnaki's, who are they, how were they described, and how do they kind of play into your research about, you know, giants and otherworldly beings mating with human beings to create these giants? Yeah, some some great questions you have there. Um, so let's go back to the ancient Sumerian civilization. And we're we're going back, you know, 5,000 years into the past. And the ancient Sumerian um, people, they recorded their history on these uh, clay tablets. And they were quite ingenious because uh, many of these tablets are still in existence to these day, to this day, whereas like, you know, stuff that was recorded on parchment and things like that, they, they might not last this long. But what they did is they would take these wet clay tablets and they had these metal cylinder seals with all their writings and their symbols. And they would roll these over these um, wet clay tablets. And they would, when it would dry, it would re record you know their their history on there. So there's still many uh, many undeciphered um, uh, they call them cuneiform uh, tablets. There's so there's a lot that haven't even been deciphered yet. But what we have uh, deciphered tells the story of the ancient Sumerian people talking about these beings that came from the sky, and they called them Anunnaki, or or those from whom heaven to earth came, and they they talked about them as being gods. They were like the gods that came from the sky and they came down and they taught their civilization everything. They gave them their laws. They taught them uh, architecture. They taught, taught them agriculture, everything. They taught them uh, how to build the ziggurats, the ancient step pyramids. And in that whole history, they also taught about how the Anunnaki were actually, um, they were there, they were. Uh, their creations. The Anunnaki came down and there were primitive uh, ape-like beings on the planet. And the Anunnaki took their DNA and they intermixed it with the with the ape people on the planet to to create us. That's that's their belief. Okay. So they believe that these gods pretty much seeded us. They were created, you know, they created us like from the, you know, from the clay of the earth. They they create they mingled. They, they mingled uh, their clay with our clay, the genetics, and created us. So that was their belief, that these gods were once among us. They gave us everything, and they created us. Yeah, that's very interesting, right? Because I've, I've heard this before. And again, I'm just thinking about the implications of if this is truly part of our history as a human race, if there's truth to this, it's very jarring for everything that we know. And speaking of what you were talking about with the Anunnaki's teaching the ancient Sumerians agriculture and like, you know, all of these different things kind of sound similar to the Nephilim who were, or, or, or the gods that, that came down who were showing humans forbidden knowledge, right? There's some similarities in that story. And right. even with the pyramids being created, there's so many speculations that, you know, it wasn't human beings who created the pyramids. It was, you know, these beings from the sky who came yes. down to really build the pyramids and give, you know, um, ancient Egyptians like technology and, and stuff, because when you look at pyramids from all over the world yes. and you can see that there's similarities in just the geometry and how they were built and how, and the structures and how they were set up. So, um, you know, I just want to know, right. Cause you know, in, in the first chapter of your book, you say history is not what we have been told, right? And you discuss the significant pieces of history that have been left out, which is what we've been discussing yes. throughout this whole show. Why do you think it's important to actually bring this knowledge to 
mainstream consciousness, right? Why do you think it's important for us to really kind of get a sense of our past and start looking at these things as possibilities in order for us to kind of um, have a better sense of what our future is going to be? Wow, that's a that's a great, very, very deep question. I, I really appreciate that question. Um, I think it is very important for the human race to um to learn about these um hidden chapters, these missing chapters of of our ancient past that have been, you know, covered up. And I, I think it is important. Um my personal belief is that uh we are we are spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings. Uh, having a human experience, not a, not human beings having a spiritual experience. And so um, I believe by learning about our true history, uh, it raises our level of consciousness. And I think that's very important because I think, and this is just my opinion, that right now the controllers of of this world, um they're they're not they're not good, they're not good individuals. And I think that they're puppets to, other uh, other forces. The Bible calls it the unseen powers and principalities and the rulers of the darkness of this world. And they are keeping us in a uh, a matrix, so to speak. And that matrix is to just um, try to convince us that we're just, uh, you know, that we're just in these meat, meat suits and we just consume and we're, we're not, we're not spirit. You know, we're not spirit. We're not, we don't have a soul. We're just, you know, we're just here one and done and, and just consume and, and, you know, live it up, you know, and just consume and produce, produce and consume. And I believe that uh, it's important to learn about the true history because it raises our consciousness. And in the process, we discover that we are so much more than what we have been told. And again, that we are spiritual beings and that we all have so much more power than what what society tells us that we that we have because many of these um theories and things that we're talking about totally conflict with the whole theory of evolution right when we were talking about well why would some of this stuff be covered up well our history doesn't tell us there were there were these intelligent giants running around on the earth that possibly had very high levels of technology going back to ancient times that would really if if that were true that would really throw off what we've been taught yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, I I was at the Museum of Natural Sciences in uh, D.C. because I live in the Northern Virginia area, so I'm very close to D.C. And they have an exhibit on you know, uh, what you just said, um, evolution, right? Especially as yeah. it pertains to human beings and other creatures. But I was on, you know, I was in the exhibit or on the side of where they were kind of showing the different um, phases of how human beings became who they are. And something that I've always been fascinated by is that, okay, when we talk about evolution, like every other um, animal or tree or plant, it takes millions, billions of years to evolve. And it just kind of seemed like overnight, you know, a couple thousand, a um, couple ten thousands of years, yeah. we just, all of a sudden we have this large brain, we have this like mm -hmm. consciousness, right? So mm -hmm. I'm like, well, there's something a little supernatural about this form yes. of evolution, right? I don't know. I don't have the answers. Like you just mm -hmm. said, you know, part of the Sumerian belief is that the Anunnaki actually seeded this mm -hmm. planet. And a lot of people believe that, that they this they seeded this planet. And, you know, something else I want to ask you is like, are these giants or these beings who came to meet with uh, human beings, are they actually aliens, right? I kind of want to get into that. Great question. Um, well, if you if you think of the term um, ET, extraterrestrial, um, what that pretty much means, well, not of the Earth. And so, if you have beings that are really not of the Earth that that are coming here, um, uh, whether they're called angels or whether they're called demons or whether they're called the Greys or whether they're called the reptilians or some other name. If they are not from this planet, technically they're extraterrestrials. So you just have these different cultures giving these different names and descriptions of these beings. But you will you will hear descriptions of um, you know ETs or angels or demons from all different cultures, all different ancient cultures talk about these um, these beings and interactions with humankind. Yes. 
you're you're spot on. So just to make sure that, you know, so the listeners are following along, there's a good chance that these gods or or these, you know, these beings, that these angels um could very much be aliens, extraterrestrials. And in what you were talking about, your your impression or your belief is that we are the elites or the people who are working in the shadows kind of controlling us potentially controlling how we view ourselves controlling yeah. the media and all of that could also potentially be aliens is that correct am i understanding you correctly i would i i would not i would not write that off as a possibility especially if you see all the craziness happening in the world and it seems to be this rush towards ultimate self destruction we have um, so-called leadership in this country that is pushing us to get us into a war with with Russia. Um, you know, we have nuclear weapons. They have nuclear weapons. Um, no one wins in that situation. Mutually assured destruction. So you have this push that to me seems alien. It seems like it's um, some force that are driving these leaders to... Um, go down the path of complete self-annihilation, self-destruction. But in my personal opinion, it's the forces behind that. They are non-human. They're non-human. And again, I go back to the Bible where it says the unseen powers and principalities and the rulers of the darkness of this of this world. And in my book, I, I talk a little bit about um, the discussion that you'd, you'd mentioned about, you know, are they e ETs? And it depends on what culture you ask. Some cultures look at them as angels. Some cultures would say, you know, these are alien beings. Um, I believe that there are the gods with the, the small g, and I believe in the god with the big g. And the gods with the small g's are ones that had, you know, technology that we would look at as humans and go, especially our ancient ancestors, and go, oh, they, they must be gods because they were so highly advanced. Uh, with their technology and even their stature, if these were giants, I mean, just their physical powers and and presence would uh, make many of these ancient peoples look at them as as being godlike. Yes, absolutely. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Dolores Cannon. I tend to quote her a lot because I've gone down a rabbit hole with a lot of her stuff and I'm still going down a rabbit hole. And she's written a couple of books called The Convoluted Universe. And, you know, she... Uh, has, you know, put many people into regressive states, past life regressions and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and a lot of what her research, um, what she found in putting all these people in regressions and th them going to their past lives, et cetera, um, is just that, you know, the, the talk about the Anunnaki seeding the planet, right? That aliens mm -hmm. potentially seeded the planet, and, you know, religion is such a big thing in, in this world, right? You have people yeah. who, you know, are, are so strong and they're so devoted to their religion, which mm -hmm. is not an issue, right? Because that right. serves as a guiding force to, you know, living life. And then you have people who don't really believe in anything, right? It's just like, we're just here by chance, whatever. Yeah. So I guess my question in all of that, right? One, one more comment is just that imagine the implications of, feeling like, okay, wait, we were seated on this planet by aliens, not, not God in the way we think about it. So I want to ask you, right. Cause you mentioned that you believe in the, in the God with the, 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 the big G, the big G, the big G, right. Exactly. Yep. So in, in doing your research and, you know, discovering all these things, what is your take on on the big G, you know, on, on God, where, where does that, how does that land for you in terms of our creation? I don't know if you actually believe that the Anunnaki's or the aliens seeded this planet, but I just want to hear, you know, how, where are you landing on, on God and, and all of yeah. that? Thank you. You're, you're asking some really deep questions that I normally don't get asked in a, in a, most of the podcasts I've done. And I, I definitely appreciate it. So, so my, my belief system is I follow the Christian faith. Um, I am very open-minded as far as other belief systems. And I love to have conversations with people that have different, um, you know, different spiritual beliefs. Um, I just love, I love, you know, learning and just um, looking at 
other people's points of view. So my belief is since researching the giants, it's actually reinforced my personal belief in in God. Now, I don't hold the belief that um, that aliens came down and, and created us. Um, however, I do see some very close parallels um, with the Anunnaki, as you mentioned earlier, and the Nephilim that are that are mentioned. There are very, very similar things in those stories. And um, that's that is uh, that is very uh, very intriguing and and interesting to me. So for myself, it's just you know reinforced, especially going back into the Bible and and finding a lot of accounts of these gi different giants and and looking at the uh, apocryphal texts as well, um, talking about these fa fallen angels that came down and um, they they corrupted our our genetics. I believe that it was a corruption of 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 humankind we had already been created and these beings came down whether you call them nephilim or whether you call them grays or some et they came and they they manipulated or tried to manipulate our genetics i believe that the earth is very very ancient i i know there are some christians that believe it's only you know four or five thousand years old i believe that is our earth is very ancient and even in the scriptures in genesis when it was talking about the creation of the creation of the earth i believe there is a gap in be in between that um can account for of a, a very ancient world and that there was a world before what was written about in genesis there was a there was a world there were beings there were there were things on this planet that were here but it was it, it was wiped out and so in genesis the account is is talking about our development, our creation, but there was definitely he, something here before, beings here before. Obviously, we have stuff like the dinosaurs, and you know, um, and now we have Nazca mummies, which I write about in my book, that are coming out of Peru that look alien, you know, elongated heads and and uh, three fingers. In fact, I have this is one of the skulls that came out of uh, out of Paracas, Peru, and there's many of these, and they look alien. They look alien and a very elongated skull. And many of these skulls, they they have a different number of plates in the skull than a than a regular Homo sapien has. Wow! Oh my God! And, look at look at the the yeah. size of that thing! Wow! Yeah. And, and what's interesting is uh, in some parts of Peru, they have these skulls and they have patches of hair still attached. Mm. Would you guess what color the hair might be? Oh God! Red. Yeah. Oh wow! <laughs> it's not indigenous to Peru, by the way. So they, they these people must have came from somewhere else. Yes, you know everything you're saying. I agree with you. I grew up in the Christian faith as well. I'm strong. I definitely believe in God, the Big G. Yes. Um, G. but I just don't think that our world is as simple as people try to make it out yes. to be. I've never believed that there's so many hidden mysteries. I mean, with what you were talking about, you know, I've heard of civilizations before this one, like Atlantis and yes, you know, there's this like warning of, okay, this happened in the past where they kind of got a little bit cocky and, you know, their technology and they ended up basically wiping themselves out if I'm understanding correctly. And yes, there's this are. warning of, okay, like we're the reset and it seems like we're heading down that path again. So when you were just talking about this, you know, rush to war and all of this conflict that's going on, I feel like there's been conflict since, you know, that's just part of oh, has yeah. built into human, yes. our, our, our nature, but yep. a lot of it just seems random. Right. And, and, you know, maybe not random, but it just seems like it needs to happen so urgently. Right. And yeah. so I agree with you there. And, and, and what I wanted to say too, is, you know, as you're doing this research, have you stumbled upon, you know, conversations or discussions around elevating our consciousness, right? So you talked a little bit about, you know, why we need to know these things, because then it yes. kind of elevates our consciousness. And yes. people are saying that, you know, there's a fight for humanity's uh, soul, right? Where some people are on the positive path towards evolution. And then there's some people who are um, evolving, but towards the negative side of things, right? Because that yes. also gets into reincarnation and, 
yeah, et cetera. Have you stumbled upon those discussions and what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I have stumbled uh, across discussions like that. In fact, um, so when I was talking with Michael Cremo, he was talking, I asked him about the yuga cycles. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the yuga cycles. No, no I'm not. It's kind of the Hindu beliefs, and they believe that um, our, our civilization goes through these different cycles. Mm -hmm. And each cycle... Um, is a reflection of our, of human consciousness. And so we, in, in the yuga cycles, there's some cycles that um, are like golden ages where, where people have advanced to high levels of consciousness and they've developed these high levels of technology. And, and then you'll have other cycles where it almost like starts to fall into a dark age. And then you have, like you said, where people are going more towards the negative consciousness and then there's like degradation in the society and the civilization becomes corrupt and kind of like the story you mentioned earlier about atlantis that was once like in a golden age and they had this uh, high level of technology and built these beautiful cities and had influence throughout the world and then they became corrupt they started to become to corrupt and misuse their power and then you know and then a cataclysm happened and, yeah. and just I literally wiped out their civilization. So his, uh, Michael's discussion of the yuga cycles was really interesting that we do go through these phases of these different cycles where you'll have high technology and it'll rise to a certain point and then things will start to get corrupt. And then eventually those civilizations could get wiped out, whether they wipe themselves out. And we have in the ancient Hindu epics that talk about in the Bhagavad Gita, I believe it is, or the Mahabharata, they they describe what uh, appears to be these aerial battles of like these UFOs or spaceships uh, blowing each other up and blowing cities up. So maybe some of these ancient civilizations, when they became um, decrepit, they they wiped themselves out, and then so things started over again. A new a new civilization started off, and it sounds like you know, and hopefully we can turn it around. But it sounds like. Like my mama used to say, we have one foot on a banana peel and one foot hanging off the edge of a cliff. <laughs> I like that saying. Yeah, no, I, I think I've, you know, I've heard so many conversations about, you know, similar to what you were just, you know, talking about, about the negative and positive path. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sit with that, right? Because I genuinely believe that there's something to be said about giving into fear, right? I've heard so many times that, it, you know, we have to be careful because you don't want to give into the the fear consciousness either, right. right? Because then you, that's just kind of feeding that negativity, right? So sometimes when you hear these conversations or when I hear these conversations, I'm just kind of like, okay, how much of this is like, we need to be aware or start to potentially think about it or how much of it is, fear mongering as well right because yes. if we do believe that there are these powers who are trying to take us more to a negative path or there's this fight for humanity's soul yes then we also have to understand that they're very smart right and they they're mm -hmm. very covert with you know implementing certain ideologies or implementing certain things into the atmosphere like fear and you know um hatred and all that stuff yes. so it's kind of like trying to balance the conversation, right? Where it's like, not all hope is lost and no. we want to stay in this, in the vibration of love and optimism, yes. but this is also could potentially be a reality, right? Absolutely. You've very eloquently stated that. Yes. And I don't know if you've ever heard the anacronym for fear. No. False evidence appearing real. Yes, I actually have heard that. Yes. That's false evidence appearing real. And what is the opposite of fear? I would say love. Love, faith. Faith, yeah. faith. All, of course yes. I should know that. Yes. Yes, yes. And so, yeah, we do need to have the balance of um, being uh, aware of some of these things that are happening in the world. But yet also, there's the old saying, you know, don't stare too long into the abyss because the abyss stares back. And that's why I feel it's so important for us to um, not get overwhelmed with all these, these things that we can't control. In, in psychology, there's a term, I think they call it a locus of control. And if you think of these circles, like these concentric circles, they represent um, areas of control that you have in your life. And at the center is yourself is your is your is your mind is your thoughts is your 
uh, it's your attitude, it's your beliefs, it's your behavior. All those things are in the circle. And when you go a little bit out from that, then you you get into like your relationship with your family, like how much influence you have in your family and friends. And then the circle gets a little bit expanded into your local community. And then the circle expands even further. And it's like maybe local government. And then it expands further and say, for example, world government. So the further you get outside of that inner circle, the further out you go, the less kind of control that you have, right? So the key is to to not get overwhelmed with all these things was happening with the with the governments and the I believe the new world order to be aware of what's happening but not consumed with it, but to go back to that center and to focus on developing yourself, to cultivate your relationship with your with your creator. Right. Develop yourself mentally and physically. And what can you do good? How can you influence those people around you closest to you, your family, your friends, your local community? What can you contribute? How can you contribute with that? And you focus on those areas that you have more influence and control and you do it in a positive way. Because those things, as we go further and further out, we we don't have control of. And it is it is very easy to get overwhelmed and like, well, I, you know. There's nothing I can do about this and all these terrible things are happening. Okay. You can't control any of that, but you can control what's up here. Yes. Very beautifully said. And, you know, a lot of times when you look at the news and there's so much chaos and the news yeah. is just bad news all the time, right? It makes you yeah. feel like there's more bad than good. And I actually believe that the world is more good than bad. It's just that nobody talks about the good stuff. Good You're stuff. Right. I believe on the that. media. Yeah. I believe I, that. And and I believe, uh, unfortunately, the media uh, has is, is a tool for the, the new world order, the Illuminati, whatever name you want to give to them. They're a, they're a mouthpiece. And like you mentioned earlier about fear, they're constantly keeping people in a state of fear. And when you're in a state of fear, constantly you don't make the best decisions yes you act with this the 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 limbic part of your brain more like the survival type of the brain or yes. you talk about maslow's hierarchy of needs right that pyramid and at the base you know self actualization is at the top of that pyramid but but if you're at the bottom and you're just trying to just struggle this you know in this economy to keep a roof over your head and 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 food and gas in your car and you're at this lower level you know, they're, they're keeping you from, from that self-actualization, from that, you know, they want to keep you in a state of fear because people are more easily controlled and manipulated when, when they're afraid. Yes, you're absolutely spot on. And what you were talking about, self-actualization and kind of focusing on, you know, your, your family and your friends and the inner work, that's really where a lot of the power lies, right? When you take that yes. time to connect with God or a higher source or a higher power or connect with something that is positive, right? Like have a, a positive orientation or value system that you connect to and act on that every single day. There's so much power in that because that really is a domino effect. And you're right. Like, you know, focus on the things we can control rather than thinking like, oh my gosh, yes. the new world order, like how are we going to stop them? And you know, the bad guys. And it's like, the world is a lot more good than bad. There are a lot of people who are more positively oriented than negatively oriented, right? We just, again, like we said, we see the the negatively oriented people or topics or consciousness being propagated more often than the positive one. And, you know, oh, to your true. point about the faith and fear, right? I was li listening to this channeler called Sheila Gillette. Gillette. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not pronouncing her last name wrong. And she channels these group of angels called Theo. And, mm -hmm. you know, in her channeling one day, she was talking about how like fear and faith really mean the same thing, right? Fear is the, um, the hope in something terrible yet unseen, whereas mm -hmm. faith is the hope in something positive yet unseen. So it's basically That's like, what switch are you going to turn on, right? Are we going to hope and you know, believe in something that's negative yet unseen, or are we going to believe in something positive that's yet unseen? So I, I tend to think about that a lot because it helps me kind of stay to the positive end of things. Very well said. Uh, uh, a saying that I heard is that, uh, um, what was it? Energy, 
maybe you can help me get this right. Energy flows where attention goes. Yes. Something like that. So if you're focusing on, like you said, if you're focusing on the negative, if you're if you're living in in constant fear, then that's that's what you're putting your energy to, and that's feeding into that. And I believe that the the, the controllers, the manipulate the manipulators of this planet. They want to keep, they feed off that. They yeah. feed off of fear. They feed off of that negative energy. And that's how they get stronger. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So, you know, have you given thought to, or what do you think about the government kind of admitting to the existence of aliens? I don't know if you saw that in the news. A lot oh, of people yeah. are saying- a, a lot of that. And, yeah. And See, this is really, that's a really interesting question because you've got to, uh, here's how I look at it. Look at the timing. Why all of a sudden with all this stuff going on, are they, are they now saying, oh yeah, we have, you know, footage from, um, you know, a, a jet fighters of these craft and they're openly showing it. And then you have all these guys from intelligence services saying, oh yeah, we have all these off world craft and alien bodies and everything. Something that the government has denied, denied, denied for decades and decades and decades. And now all of a sudden they're just spilling the beans with all the craziness that's happened in the, in the past four years. Now they're they're talking about this stuff. It's like, why? Yes. Why now? And and so my belief is that I do believe there are there are extraterrestrials, there are aliens, there are advanced civilizations. Um, so I believe in their existence. And I'm also a Christian, you know. I, I believe I believe in God, I believe in the God of the Bible. But I, I believe that God is a creator God, and that you know, we're not the only ones of his creations. It'd be like a master artist painting a, a master painting and go, oh beautiful i'm done with it i'm never going to i'm never going to pick up that paintbrush again and do anything right i think god's so much bigger than that i think god's constantly creating constantly creating so i i believe there's room for for extraterrestrials and and i believe in you know the biblical view of of the bible and so yeah look at the timing and i believe that now this is being um pushed on us to set us up for a potential massive manipulation which i believe um the 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 you know one world government you know to get us into a one world government you know the new world order would use something like this to create fear in people but to get us to unite as a world together in fact ronald reagan said it in one of his speeches back in 1985 he said um he said how quickly would we put aside all of our differences if a threat from outside of this world, an extraterrestrial threat came upon us. And I believe that it could very well be used as a tool to, to manipulate people, to get us all in a state of fear and get us all to go along with whatever the new world order wants to do because they operate off the Hegelian dialectic, which is problem, reaction, solution. They create the problem, but they cover it up and they blame it on something else they get the reaction, which is fear-based, which is what you were talking about, right? People don't make good decisions when they're when they're in, in fear, and they, they will go along with the people that are the perceived experts, right? And they'll just follow along with them. So they create the problem, they get the reaction, and then they come along with the solution to the very problem they created, and that solution is whatever form of manipulation that they want to impose on us. Yes, you said it. Because I was like, why now? You know, yeah. there's so many programs that people have come out and admitted to people who were in the government, people who were in the army with so many like processes in place of dealing with extraterrestrial beings. That's, you yeah. know, there's so many people who've talked about this. But you like you said, the government has denied, denied, denied. So finally, now they're giving us a little bit and again, you have to question, why now? What are they distracting us from potentially? What are yeah. they hoping to build upon in order to maybe, you know, excuse war, right? And there's also this like race to space with Elon Musk and yeah. um, Jeff Bezos. So with all of these things happening, it just makes you wonder what's going on, right? And I think part of why I love to have these conversations, right? Because whoever's listening to this, please 
make your own judgments, right? Yeah. No, but we're not trying to impose an ideology on you. We're just having really and truly a discussion because we don't have all of the answers, right? We don't know everything, right? This is just, you know, an open discourse. But I think a lot of people don't give enough thought to why do I believe what I believe? You know, not to say like live this world being so um, kind of, uh, suspicious all the time. Like nobody's yeah. talking about that, but you know, why don't we question, right? Like you said, God is so much bigger than what we could ever fathom. And ever since I was a young girl, I just thought, how do you know what God is thinking? How do you know this is, these are the rules he came up with? How do you know? How do you know? And you know, it's, it's, it's led me on this path, right? Where I'm having this podcast and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with you, but yeah. you're absolutely right. I think you know, we're being controlled because we are not taught or it's not, you know, it's not a value system to kind of question our beliefs and kind of do our own research and come up with our own conclusions. Yes. Because I believe in God, like you said, I'm, I'm Christian just like you, but these conversations need to be had and being Christian does not negate me from actually thinking like, how did we actually you know, come about? What is the point and purpose of this existence? Sure. What's happening in the world, you know? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, Floyd, this has been a great conversation. We ended yes, up going. <laughs> you've you've asked me some very deep questions um, and I, I love it. Um, yeah, I, most yeah. of the podcasts I've done uh, haven't gone down into more of the spiritual side and especially having to do with what we're all dealing with now with um, just the uh, chaos in, in yes. the world and, and um, you know, what, what can we do? You know, what can we do about that? And again, it goes back, it goes back to that locus of control. What can you control? What areas can you control? You can, you can control your attitude, your, you know, you can work on your beliefs. You can work on your beliefs. Like you said, yeah. you can examine your beliefs, take some time, examine your beliefs. And if there are beliefs that are, um, that are unhealthy that you have, question those beliefs. It doesn't mean, you know, because you have a belief in place that, um, that you can't change a belief, right? Yes. Yes. If, and especially if it's unhealthy and it's, you know, if it's dragging you down, just take some time to examine yourself. Uh, was it Aristotle said uh, an unexamined life is not worth living or yes. maybe Socrates? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I ask these deep questions because I think everything's connected. You know, I yes. just can't imagine that you I mean, it's possible, but I just assume that if you're if you're doing these research into ancient mysteries and you're coming across all this evidence about giants and you're looking yeah. at all these different stories that have been chucked up to mythology, I, I, I just would have to believe that you, you know, had more thoughts about spirituality and you know Absolutely. outer worldly things so yeah i'm I'm happy that you've given thought to that and we can really have this discussion absolutely yeah it just strengthened my my belief in god and in 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 my faith and yes. i think that um we are all being tested now and and there's going to be bigger tests to come yes and so now is the time. Now is the time to um, open up your consciousness, to work on developing developing yourself and influencing those around you in a in a in a positive way. I mean, it's like throwing a rock in a pond. When that little pebble goes in the water, it creates these ripples. Yes. What kind of ripples can you create? What kind of positive ripples can you create throughout your your interactions with your friends, your family, strangers, your local community? Yes. Yeah. We're all waking up. I think we're all waking up. I think that's why there's so many podcasts like this and we're, we're definitely elevating in consciousness. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, again, Floyd, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I like to ask a fun question at the very end. Um, I like to ask, you know, have you shifted in perspective on anything recently? And it could be as lighthearted or, or as deep as you want it to be. That's boy, you've got a uh, you've got some awesome deep questions, and I love it. So, what I've been really working on um, the past couple years is to live more intentionally, 
And so how I started to do that is I'm I'm getting up at 5.30 in the morning. Um, and the first thing I do is I get into the scripture for 30 mm -hmm. minutes. I pray. I think prayer is very, very important because ultimately with, with everything going on, I think really it is a spiritual battle at its core that we're dealing with. And so I, I, I start with getting into the word prayer and I exercise for about 45 minutes to an hour in the morning. And, and that's how I start my day. You know, that's how I start my day. And at the end of my day, what I'm doing now is I'm doing what's called uh, an examination of conscience. And I'm sure you probably heard of, heard of it or some variation. And I, I simply just mentally review my day. And I have a little journal. I even write it down. Like, what are, you know, what are the good things that I did today? And I write it down. And where did I fall short? And I write mm -hmm. those things down. And then the third thing I put is what am I going to do differently for those things that I fell short? And just to keep that up here and, and to take the time to write it down. So I do that every single day. And that helps me to be mindful of how, how I am. How am I being in the in the world? Yes, thank you, Floyd. That was that was beautiful. Thank you for joining Shifting Dimensions. I I know that the listeners probably really enjoyed this conversation because I loved it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs>